Welcome to the Journey of the Universe 10 Years Later podcast. I'm joined today uh, by Missy Lauren. Uh, Missy Lauren began her legal career as a public interest lawyer in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1993. She would call herself an activist on environmental and human rights issues, and this would include citizen suits and environmental enforcement cases. She recently received her PhD in religion and philosophy under cosmologist Brian Swim and a master's in integral education with Montessori educator John Fowler. Her dissertation published last year was a middle school curriculum for Earth Day. It bridged new discoveries in earth science with philosophy and the rights of nature and her master's focus on ecozoic philosophy of education. Right now, Missy is active on the board of three nonprofits, Planetary Advocates, a media group that made three films on climate change and renewable energy, including the feature film, The Future of Energy. Eleanor Lives, a human rights organization working to expand the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Earth Law Center, where she is the chair of the board um, it's a law and policy center that develops rights of nature campaigns. Welcome, Missy. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. How did you first encounter the universe story in your own life, life journey? Well, I heard about it 10 years ago when I started mm -hmm. grad school out in San Francisco. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, the book was 30 years old. Um, mm -hmm. It was written in 1992. And I was lucky enough to learn about the universe story from one of the writers of the book, Brian Swim, who was my teacher in my um, philosophy program. Mm, amazing. And what were the big takeaways for you and what resonated with you from both that universe story book and from the journey of the universe film? Well, I mean, I, I would say that the biggest accomplishment of the universe story was I mean, for me, not only learning the scientific account of creation, but watching the ways in which mm. a gifted writer and filmmaker could make science come alive. Mm. Yeah. And so big takeaways for me were really how to expand my own career as a teacher, how to make science come alive in my own work, um, yeah. how to use story and how to evoke like awe and wonder um, in my students so that they would jump into the, like, their fullest creativity, I would say. Mm, amazing. And you're somebody who wears a number of different caps and has a remarkable um, career in, in education and in, in the law profession. How has the new story shaped the direction of your life? You know, I would just start out by saying that I sort of see a difference between the universe story and the new story. Um, the universe story was written in 92, but the new story was written in 78. <laughs> and back at that time, Thomas Berry was really on the cutting edge of identifying the fact that we were in between stories. You yeah. know, there's the old story and the new story, yeah. which is that scientific account, but society and culture hadn't really caught up with it. Yeah. And so, when when I think about what's happening now, I think society has really stepped in and leaned into the new story now. And it's alive in so many professions and disciplines. You mentioned before this idea of reinventing the human at the species level and how influential that idea from Thomas Berry was. Thomas Berry, author of that new story essay in 1978. Can you say a little bit about how that idea of reinventing the human has uh, been influential in your own path? Well, that idea of reinventing the human is from the new story. And I think mm. that that's really the thing that inspired me the most. Mm. Um, mm. I just found the idea to be um, such a bold statement. And, mm. you know, how do we do that? Is that even possible? Mm. And so, you know, I spent six years thinking about it <laughs> and ended mm. up writing my entire dissertation really on that idea you know 600 mm. pages of okay if i was to write a curriculum that reinvented the human what would it be and that's essentially my dissertation we'd love to hear a little bit more about your dissertation this earth day curriculum you designed for middle school um how did you uh come up with the idea and what was the overall uh sort of ethos of this curriculum 
you know, I, I basically tried to do what Brian Swin did in the universe story, um, where you write stories to communicate science. And I wrote about 20 stories about the five different kingdoms of life. Mm -hmm. So one of them's on black gold, one of them's on Robin Hood, one of them's on the original shrew, one of them's on Vic Angla, the eukaryote. And, you know, for those of you who've read the universe story, some of them might ring a bell. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, you know, stories from Brian's class that are so funny, like mm -hmm. the shrew being... Um, you know, the origin of all mammals because it survived the mass extinction. Mm. Um, you know, it's a tragic, it's a, the extinction's a tragic tale, but, mm. you know, then to think that we all came from a shrew and human beings are 35% shrew is a fun mm. story to tell kids in a classroom. Wow. And then something else that I'm kind of proud about is just really trying to bring peak learning experiences into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I was influenced by that pedagogical approach of um, the zone of proximal development mm -hmm. and trying to weave that in. And I also was excited to try and bring in expanded states of consciousness and um, without explicitly saying it, but bring nature mysticism into mm -hmm. um, a series of embodied practices um, mm -hmm. for the classroom day. And then when I taught activism is, you know, to try to empower all the students when um, through the butterfly effect, mm -hmm. because that's a scientifically proven phenomena of systems mm -hmm. theory. And by teaching you know, seventh grade all about systems theory, I think students could really feel empowered that, you know, their actions can make a difference. I know you've also talked about distinguishing, for instance, the hero's journey, um, which has perhaps a more individualistic um, bent to it from the heroic community. And I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on, on that distinction. Well, I am glad you asked that because I really played with that a lot. And I was influenced by um, Daniel Goleman on that and, and really my own philosophy program. And there's a psychologist, a team, a husband and wife team, and they developed this whole like whole on system of the self that included in, intrapersonal, interpersonal and echo personal and yeah. even though they had other levels i decided to embed those first three in what i built and yeah. um with the interpersonal it's really making friends with your own psyche and your own multiple and classmates getting to know your community and the world around you and the echo personal is really getting to know the natural world around you yeah. and um and i sort of see that as the you know the hero's journey but kind of expanding into the heroic community which is a term that rick tarnas one of my professors in my uh, philosophy program developed and that's another really inspiring idea that i i wanted to try and develop for students where all those things your psyche your personal relationships and your relationships with the natural world form part of this heroic community um, you know moving into the future to like build you up and give you support as you go on your hero's journey <laughs> mm -hmm. wow such a powerful idea thank you now you're drawing a lot on on integral uh, theory and integral education um, which was a term you know that was very much uh, influenced by Thomas Berry's work. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the theory of integral education, what that entails and how it can be applied? Different, yeah, contexts? My philosophy program is pretty unique. I'm at the California Institute mm -hmm. of Integral Studies. <laughs> and mm -hmm. my program is founded on the work of Sri Aurobindo, who um, wrote about integrating the physical, the vital, the mental, the psychic, and the spiritual into one's like education and unfolding. Mm -hmm. And so beginning with that, you know, I worked my way into learning how educators brought mm -hmm. in an integral vision. So the work of mm -hmm. Daniel Goleman in multiple intelligences, I mm -hmm. wove into my curriculum. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, like ecological and emotional intelligence. And then mm -hmm. I wove in the work of 
psychologist Ken Wilber who mapped out the psyche because I wanted to look at the whole psyche and try and weave that in. And then um, the work of like Abraham Maslow on consciousness. Fascinating. And I know you've, you've done some other work in education, um, you know, teaching philosophy to middle school girls and um, attending, you know, a variety of conferences and um, design thinking and social emotional learning. Can you say a little bit more about how you've been steeped in sort of educational theory and kind of uh, come to this integral education vision that, that you're cultivating? So I was in school to get my PhD in philosophy, but what I ended up building was a curriculum. <laughs> and uh. so the problem is, is if I'm not trained as an educator, how do I, you know, meet the high academic standards of both disciplines? And so it really became a self-study mm. where, you know, I figured I should get a master's in education. I figure I should get time in, in a classroom. And so I taught middle school girls philosophy for about six semesters. Mm. And um, I attended these amazing innovative learning conferences that were happening out at the Nueva School in San Mateo where you know teachers were coming from all over the world to share best practices and new pedagogies mm -hmm. and share their innovations and mm -hmm. then i also you know worked in a cohort of other educators where we collaborated online and mm -hmm. shared stories and basically were community for each other I'm curious to hear, how did you organize your dissertation, um, mapping out this, this huge um, inter interdisciplinary curriculum? Yeah, how did, what did the structure look like? So, I mean, originally I had big plans. <laughs> it was <laughs> gonna be people, profit, planet, and place. And it was gonna be four mm -hmm. days of these mm -hmm. ideas and I was gonna cover K through 12, I was gonna cover the whole universe story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then in the end, I basically boiled it down to um, middle school. And in the universe story, I just focused on the five kingdoms of life. And mm -hmm. You know, it was really fun to focus on middle school students in the end. I didn't know that they were going to be, you know, developmentally so fascinating to write for. Um, they're kind of at that sweet spot between fantasy and scientific inquiry. And um, so anyway, I built, you know, it basically was in three pieces, science, philosophy, and activism. Mm -hmm. And the, the science part was the universe story. The philosophy mm -hmm. part was Thomas Berry, Brian Swin, and Joanna Macy. And the activism was the Earth Law Center and other just amazing um, accomplishments that activists had made in the environmental movement that I gathered from around the world. Yeah, I was curious to hear a little bit more about that activism part too, um, working with young people. and. I know you've been inspired by the Thomas Berry's idea of the great work, the or what Joanna Macy calls the great turning, the transition to an era of human earth flourishing. How how did how did you embed that idea either from Macy or from Berry into this curriculum for young people? Well, I mean that kind of goes back to a little bit of my personal story. So Mm. Basically, since childhood, me and my best friend that I grew up with across the street, <laughs> mm. we just always just shared this common vision to protect nature, fight for justice, and make the world a better place. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've just always worked towards that through, you know, my education and then as a professional becoming an mm. environmental lawyer and activist. Mm. But, you know, it's kind of strange to admit, but I actually went back to school to study philosophy because I was so burned out in the mm -hmm. environmental movement. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. amazing thing about going back to school is I ended up getting totally re-inspired by the work of Thomas Berry and by Joanna Macy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, Thomas Berry's The Great Work and mm -hmm. um, Joanna Macy's The Great Turning Class. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Barry talked about every civilization having this great task to accomplish. And mm -hmm. he talked about going from this destructive um, society to a mutually enhancing society. And mm -hmm. Joanna was, was similar. She, you know, she said that this is the essential adventure of our time and that we could mm -hmm. transition from this industrial growth society to 
a life-sustaining civilization. And so these ideas, I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> I had this new revived energy to go back into activism and um, like with their help, I felt that I was like more grounded and sustained to do it. Yeah, and I know a lot of folks in the environmental movement struggle with burnout and, and despair and you know, Jane Goodall just recently published this book on hope, um, you know, sort of uh, reflecting on decades of her primatology research and her environmental activism. And um, it's so important, I find, to find those wellsprings of hope when you're trying to, you know, lean into this environmental work. Um, and in that vein, I'm, I'm kind of interested to pivot towards some of your legal work, um, especially with the Earth Law Center, where I know you are serving as the chair of the board and working on a remarkable array of cases, particularly among issues of rights of nature, ascribing legal uh, protections to the more than human world. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the Earth Law Center. Well, I just have to give a shout out to Herman Green because he just <laughs> sent me that book about hope. And uh, mm. he just said it was amazing and it's sitting right here at my desk. And so thank you, mm -hmm. Herman, who has actually, he's the one that brought me onto the board of the Earth Law Center which wow. I discovered doing the research for my dissertation. I actually wasn't that familiar with their work. Um, mm -hmm. Like most people, I'm more familiar work, with the work of Earth Justice. I was just, first of all, so amazed by the Earth Law Center because they're blazing so many new trails. And mm -hmm. I came to find out that it was actually founded on the principles of Thomas Berry. It was founded by Sister Pat Seaman, Simon, who is a lawyer and a Dominican sister. And, um, you know, it's built on Barry's most foundational idea that the earth should be a community of subjects, not a collection of objects. Mm -hmm. And so, because basically we live in a rights-based system, the Earth Law Center works with rights of nature. And by giving nature rights, that essentially like levels the playing field not that that's the only um, thing that we should be working on, but it's at least a start. The Earth Law Center works in all kinds of other ways too, like the rights of future generations, um, common law, indigenous legalities, um, you know, movement lawyering. So it's this, it's like an umbrella for a lot of different iterative ways to um, bring that vision for a community of subjects alive. I know there's been a lot of attention around writing, uh, granting rights of nature to the Wanganui River, uh, historically stewarded by the Maori people in New Zealand and um, to the Ganges and the Yamuna in India um, from, I think, the High Court of Uttarakhand a number of years ago. I, can you tell us some something about uh, the cases that are uh, ongoing with the Earth Law Center? I know you, you mentioned a recent rights of nature case in Panama. Are there any others that you find particularly compelling and, and worth sharing? Yeah, let's start with one because it just happened in December and it's really exciting. So I think one of the biggest challenges for rights of nature is it has to be more than just a declaration, right? Mm. They have to be enforceable. And mm. the best way that you can make something enforceable is to make it enforceable at the constitutional level. And mm. that's you know, very different from at the state level or through uh, court judgments or through, you know, a local municipality. Really, the Constitution is the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. And Ecuador was our first, you know, country in the world to put rights of nature in their Constitution. But it remained to be seen whether or not they were going to stand up when it came to enforcement. And I'm happy to report that there were two landmark decisions that came out of Ecuador. One, you know, protected man mangroves from monoculture, mm -hmm. and the other protected this incredible national mm -hmm. cloud forest from a mining concession. They were mm -hmm. gonna mine um, copper and gold in two thirds of this protected forest. And mm -hmm. in both cases, uh, the rights of nature prevailed. And so now we have this precedent to build off of. And there's mm. momentum in other Latin American countries to do the same thing. And uh, so that's really exciting. As you know, Bolivia follows suit and we have cases coming out of Colombia on the Atrato River. And um, mm. so momentum's building. Mm -hmm. So inspiring to, to hear. And 
You mentioned um, indigenous legalities, and I'm interested in how uh, the Earth Law Center is thinking about you know this communion of subjects perspective and and the rights of indigenous people, seeing people as part of the bioregions that they inhabit, and how has the Earth Law Center sort of um, be it been attended to issues of justice and eco justice as they, you know, as they pertain especially to um, indigenous communities. I wish honestly that I could say more about that. Um, I'd have to refer you to some of the earth lawyers that are literally on the staff of the Earth Law Center that are yeah. working in that space. We have Costanza, we have Ellie, um, mm. and they're these remarkable young women who are experts in the field and um, really on the cutting edge of, you know, shaping new law in this iterative process through mm. trial and error and experimenting. And um, mm. it's interesting because mm. I, um, I'm i really excited, really in my role as chairman of the board, <laughs> to have the world get to know these lawyers. And so we're having this big annual event um, in New York City in September. And I had this vision where I would love to have murals painted in New York for these four lawyers, all women, by the way, working on indigenous legalities where this like tapestry of ideas and um, nature and the issues in the case were all just like brought to life in this artistic, creative way oh, to really yeah. spread the word about what this movement could mean for the earth, yeah. like bringing indigenous legalities and how conflicts are resolved and the balancing of all parties in an ecosystem, how that might look. So mm. Just an idea yeah. that I've been playing with. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful idea. And, you know, it occurs to me that you know, rights of nature and earth jurisprudence require a, a sort of shift in in consciousness, you know, to um, think about the um, integrity of the more than human world of which we are part. So what shifts do you see needing to happen, um, both within legal frameworks and perhaps just socially, culturally, in order for, you know, rights of nature to become more pervasive, more readily adopted? I mean, there have to be shifts on multiple levels, you know, yeah. internationally, nationally, and locally. First of all, at the biggest level, there's some big things that could happen. We could add rights of nature to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is in negotiation right now. Yeah, yeah. We could add rights of nature to the biodiversity on the high seas treaty. We yeah. could add... Um, enforceable rights for nature into a new version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is about to have its 75th anniversary. So mm. there's there's all these ways that we could acknowledge it internationally as a community. Mm. And then there's, you know, there's ways that we can do it nationally with our constitutions, with our state laws, with our judiciary, with our local laws. Mm. And um, so it's it's really a question of like all institutions, like Barry said, all professions, all aspects of academia, jumping mm. in and realizing that, you know, it's probably going to come down to, in a way, everybody participating in making our legal system work for everyone in an mm. enforceable way. Yeah, one other um, case that occurred to me that I wanted to ask you about is I know you've done some advocacy work in California on behalf of factory farmed animals. Can you talk a little bit about uh, those legal protections you've, you've been fighting for as well? I love to talk about this. <laughs> um, and it brings me back to like this journey that I've been on with my best friend. <clears throat> because, you know, being out here in California, <clears throat> the, well, the reason I moved out here to start my legal career is because all this amazing new law was coming out of the Bay Area, mm. coming out of the Ninth Circuit um, Federal Court. And it's also, you know, the people out here are, mm. um, I mean, we have this beautiful natural environment and maybe what it does is it provokes this desire to protect it. But I've mm. seen that so much innovative legislation comes out of here. And so it's just been fun to be a lawyer mm. working in this movement. 
And I always said that I was going to come out of retirement as a lawyer if a couple cases ever came up. And one of them was factory farms, and another one was the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, both of which um, those cases got active, you know, just a couple years ago. So with Prop 12, what happened was California was, you know, the first state in the country to basically say, we don't like how certain categories of farm animals are being treated. It was veal, it was chickens, and it was pigs. And so they said, here in our state, we're going to make farming practices more humane. And there were multiple challenges to this California law, maybe 14 of them, all of which the state managed to prevail in. And so a couple years later, the state said, you know what? We're gonna ban import into the state of you know, meats that don't meet these minimum standards. And so there was this big campaign called Prop 12 to get it on the ballot. Mm. And it was just fun for me to work on that campaign because mm. um, I had to participate really on a grassroots level to even get it on the ballot by just going up to people and trying to explain the issues <laughs> to them and mm. get them to listen to me because you know you're, you you um, you really have to have your talking points down and people who aren't vegetarians, you know, might feel bad, might not want to engage with the issue of factory farms. And so it's just a way of, of educating people to say, no, here's how we can participate and here's how we can make a difference as a community. And I'm happy to report that mm-hmm. Prop 12 was passed by the largest um, majority in California's voter history. And then, you know, once it passes in California, other states become emboldened to bring their own version of Prop 12 on the ballot. And then, you know, just circling back to my best friend, Susan, who is actually going to be building like a a rescue for certain types of farm animals. Um, She'll be working on it in Vermont. And so there's there's ways that you can approach this issue from like the grassroots level of her literally having a sanctuary and for me who's like working on the issue from a legal perspective getting it on the ballot i imagine gives you great hope and energy to have some of those legal victories to you know inspire you to keep going um and so powerful to see you know how that sort of inspiration was sown in your childhood and with your friend from across the street and I know um, in terms of looking forward, you've mentioned working on behalf of the Snake River in the Pacific Northwest. Um, can you say a little bit more about that push for you know, rights of nature within you know, the continental US? It's tricky. Rights of nature are tricky because what we found is it has to be this iterative process because if local um, municipalities try and draft a rights of nature statute, it can get struck down at the state or federal level. Um, And so you can't have it be too ambitious, but then you can't have it be too void for vagueness. And so what we're learning is that, you know, um, to really try and work at the state level and get the state legislature to soften and give ecosystems you know, rights, like look at a, a stronger or a, a broader view so that then local um, areas are more emboldened to like run with it and look at the rivers in their communities and then try and strike this balancing because trying to come up with, mm. you know, concrete ways of how you protect this river, you know, how many gallons do you need it to flow? you know, should a river be entitled to the its maximum amount of biodiversity? Should a dam be prevented from being built on it? These are really tough questions mm. to sort out. And so what we're finding is that a constitutional provision is the best way to go. And then, mm. you know, a statute at the state is the next best. And then mm. the third best is local, <laughs> unfortunately, mm. yeah. I'm curious to hear you, you speak a little bit more about ecocentric law and sort of what that entails as a kind of legal paradigm and um, and yeah how that might influence you know um, some of your rights of nature work. So a little bit on that, I happen to have this on my desk, 
and it's really pretty battered. Um, this is basically like the first written version of Ecocentric Law, and um, it's the new textbook that the Earth Law Center just wrote and published just last year. And it's meant to be, you know, a guide for practitioners and to teach law students. And it's building out an entirely new field. It's, um, it's a legal framework that includes rights of nature, but it would also cover things like criminalizing ecocide, um, the rights of future, future generations, human environmental rights, legal guardianship, um, ecological economics. So it's, it's really you know, a survey of all the attempts from around the world that we could gather that are gaining traction. And that's this body of ecocentric law. Yeah, it just um, it really inspires me to see how you're carrying forward this um, vision of the great work. And, you know, one of the four uh, essential components of, of that for, for Barry was rights of nature, or jurisprudence. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing to see you and, and the Earth Law Center really trying to make, you know, uh, th that a tangible reality, working both within existing legal frameworks, but also imagining how our understanding of rights and personhood might expand. And perhaps I can ask you a little bit about sort of returning to some of your interest in, your interests in philosophy, how the idea of personhood and um, animacy in the more than human world, the sentience, the intelligence, throughout um, the natural world, how that um, has shaped your, your thinking and, and your work. I love talking about that because I really <laughs> learned about the natural world writing my dissertation. Um, mm. Because, you know, when I focused on middle school and I focused on, you know, in the universe story, you have this sequence, mm. you have the uh, the great flaring forth or the big bang you have the formation of galaxies you have mm. the formation of earth and then you get the life um, and mm. that's what i focused on for middle school and so when i focused on life i looked at the five kingdoms of life and mm. i actually didn't even know what they all were you know back in the old days we thought there were just plants and animals but mm. now we have fungi and we have monera and we have protista and in the old days, we didn't even know how many species they, there were. And now we've come to realize that there's thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of species. And we're all, you know, we're just recently cataloging them all. And so when you think of rights, you know, really rights would extend to all species, whether they're protista or monera, like that's what Thomas Berry would say that yeah. the entire kingdom of life, the entire earth community would yeah. fall under this, this range of, yeah. of beings that are worthy of protection and it would even extend to non-human life. Yeah. You know, the right of a mountaintop to exist, yeah. um, the right of a river to exist, the right of an ecosystem. Um, yeah, and I've also been so inspired by the sort of outpouring of scholarship about mycelium networks and the sort of complex interconnectivity of, you know, of forests, for instance, drawing on the recent um, uh, old growth webinar uh, that we hosted here um, through the Yale School of the Environment and Orion Magazine, um, moderated by Mary Evelyn Tucker. Um, so it's, uh, I share in your excitement about um, the sort of the scientific insights on on the interconnected world we live in and, and how it connects with so many indigenous insights and um, life ways of living in, a, in an animate and communicative earth community. Do, do you have any concluding thoughts you'd like to share with, with, uh, with us here, Missy? Well, just to, just to riff off the last point that you just made, um, I, I guess I would just like to conclude with the power of story. <laughs> Um, you know, that's what we learned from the universe story. And yeah. I think that's what we learned from podcasts like this. Just yeah. Yeah. all of us telling our personal stories about how we contribute to the great work. Yeah. And just from my own personal journey, um, when I wrote my dissertation, I wrote about 20 stories uh, to teach kids about the science of those five kingdoms of life. Yeah. And, you know, 
when you talk about the mycelium network, um, they're called like the Robin Hood. <laughs> and so one of my stories was like the story of Robin Hood or the story yeah. of black gold, which refers to all this life in our soil. Um, and mm. so I guess I'd just like to conclude with that, that, you know, how fun to write stories and share them and, um, and like communicate awe. Absolutely. Well, we're so grateful that you could be part of our story here and uh, so inspired by the work you're doing. And thank you so much, Missy, for joining us. And we're wishing you well in all of your future work and endeavors. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you.